So for this last talk, this is Dr. McFarland's talk, actually. Uh, and he did express that he was really disappointed that he is stuck in New York and not able to give this. But Dr. McFarland, many of you know, he is an assistant professor of neurology here at UF. And he's the Wright Paul Simmons Professor of PSP and Atypical Parkinsonisms. And he runs our general Atypical Parkinsonisms Clinic. And then I run our Lewy Body Dementia Clinic. But both he and I are the two main physicians seeing atypical specific, specific uh, patients in our clinics. But all of our movement disorder physicians have training in the atypical Parkinsonisms. So if you see one of our other physicians, you are also in good hands. And this last talk is going to talk about treatment of the atypical Parkinsonisms, and we'll also talk about where we are going with research. So all of the therapy for the atypical Parkinsonisms right now is really a common theme. And that is our multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary care. You heard from our team, so we're, that we're coming from it from every direction. Beyond just treatment, we also think about things like palliative care that Francis mentioned, and then we look ahead towards research opportunities. So we learn more about these diseases, what is happening, and how hopefully we will work towards a cure. So right now, when we think about these group these diseases as a group or a whole, there are some similarities. And we've talked about those already this morning. Right now, we have no cure and we have no way to stop or slow them. So we really fo are focusing on symptomatic management, figuring out what are the biggest deals in your life or the life of your loved one and treating those symptoms. We often try drugs that we use in Parkinson's disease because after all, these are Parkinson-isms, and they don't work quite as well, but sometimes, for some people, they'll provide modest benefit. And they're really our best chance at helping the Parkinson-like symptoms, so we almost always give them a try, at least the carbidopa levodopa. We don't try many of the other Parkinson's disease medications, because they're less likely to help and because the side effects can be more problematic in people with the atypical Parkinsonisms than with regular Parkinson's disease. So that risk-benefit ratio can be different in these diseases than Parkinson's. So most of the time when we think about Parkinson's drugs, we focus mostly on the carbidopa, levodopa, the cinnamet, and sometimes on the MAOB inhibitors those are much milder medications, but those are things like resagiline and selegiline. There are medications called dopamine agonists. That would be like Pramipexol, Mirapex, Rapinarol, Requip, the Nupro patch. And those we sometimes try in the right circumstances. So for example, there's a little bit of evidence that maybe those will help dystonia. And so sometimes we try them in MSA or there's been some uh, uh, weak evidence that maybe amantadine will help MSA, so sometimes we try these other drugs. But the dopamine agonist, the pramipexol, the rapinarol, has some problematic side effects. So they can increase the risk of hallucinations. Obviously that's bad in dementia with Lewy bodies when the risk of hallucinations is high already. And it can make the, those medications can make the blood pressure drop, which is a problem in both dementia with Lewy bodies and MSA, where blood pressure dropping is already a problem. So there isn't a hard and fast rule here, but in general, especially because you get less bang for your buck with these medications and the atypicals than in Parkinson's disease proper, that risk benefit judgment changes and we're less likely to use the PD drugs other than carbidopa, levodopa, and the MAOB inhibitors. So your physician and me with my patients, we do sometimes try them if we think it makes sense for you. It's really important that we focus not just on the Parkinson symptoms, but also on the other symptoms. So for example, when we think of other movement problems, People with these diseases can have a dystonia, that abnormal posturing. 
And sometimes Botox injections can be really helpful for those. So we'll think about Botox injections. For some of these diseases, you can have muscle stiffness from spasticity, which is a little bit different from the rigidity that we see in Parkinsonism. There are multiple ways to have muscle stiffness. So if you have that spasticity, sometimes we try muscle relaxants, but muscle relaxants don't usually help the rigidity that's part of Parkinson's. Uh, we'll talk in a few slides about jerks. There are some medicines we can try if you have jerks. And then we also make sure that we're focusing not only on the movement problems, but also on the non-movement problems. And when we think about non-movement problems, we think about urinary symptoms, constipation, that low blood pressure, mood, so depression and anxiety, very common in these diseases and the cognitive problems. And so when we think about treatment, we want to make sure that we're coming at it from every angle. So we know that with many of these diseases, as disabling as they are physically, when we do research on what are the major drivers of quality of life, depression and anxiety come up again and again and again. Now, that doesn't mean to say that your physical symptoms are disabling, they are, but they are only a component of what is driving the quality of life. And in the research studies, big drivers of quality of life are also depression and anxiety. Well, my drugs aren't very good for the movement problems that you're having, but I do have a lot of different drugs that I can try for depression and anxiety and if we can treat that and treat it effectively, we can have a big impact on quality of life, even though our medicines aren't working well for the movement problem. So when we think about things like targeting quality of life, part of what that means is attacking your disease and your symptoms from every angle. Let's try what we can try for the movement problems, knowing that it may not work as well as we really want. Let's try what we can for that dystonia with the Botox. Let's try what we can to help the blood pressure dropping. Let's try what we can to help the depression. So we're coming at it from every angle, making sure that we're helping you and your symptoms as much as we can. So when we think about PSP and cortical basal degeneration, we think about treating the, the movement symptoms, possibly treating the cognitive symptoms, and then also treating some of the mood and lability symptoms. So from a movement perspective, for the Parkinsonism, we usually try carbidopa, levodopa, or cinnamon. And for all of these diseases, we really have to push to a high dose oftentimes if we expect to see a benefit. So you know, in Parkinson's, maybe we'll start with three pills a day, gradually go to four or five. But in these diseases, we often go higher and higher, and we don't fully give up until people are on 10 pills a day. Because we know that sometimes we aren't gonna see a benefit until we get to that high dose. So generally, if I'm not seeing any benefit, I'll keep going higher and higher gradually until I hit at least that 10. If at 10 I haven't seen much improvement, the likelihood that I'm going to see more with a higher dose is low. So if there is absolutely nothing happening at 10 pills a day, then I usually gradually back off because I don't want you on a medicine that's not doing anything. But we might have to try higher doses for less benefit than we would with someone with Parkinson's disease proper. We talked a little bit about uh, dystonia. We use uh, the Botox mostly. Um, some people with these diseases, their eyes close and they have trouble opening them. Botox around the eyes can also be helpful for that. We will generally not use some other medicines used for dystonia. That would be something like Artane or Trihexaphenidyl because those can make you confused or make your urinary problems worse. So again, the risk is pretty high with those. There is absolutely no consensus on whether we should be trying to treat the cognitive problems in PSP. So the cholinesterase inhibitors that are mentioned on this slide, those are drugs that are mostly FDA approved for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and we have
have taken them from Alzheimer's disease and tried them in these other diseases that also affect thinking. With the exception of DLB, which we'll talk about in a minute, there's not great research or great consensus about whether we should try them and what they might do. And then the last point on the slide talks about emotional liability, but does kind of get to that same issue of we need to be treating all of mood-related issues. So some people with PSP will have something called pseudobulbar affect, where they cry when they're not really sad or they'll laugh when it's not really funny. This can happen in the other atypicals as well. And that obviously can be very awkward if you're at a funeral and someone is laughing out loud. Uh, and that has happened with some of the people I've worked with. Um, so there are, there's one FDA approved medication to help with that liability or that inappropriate laughing and crying. That's the dextromorphanquinidine, which I can't say very well. Um, and then we also can try antidepressants in that situation and also use the medicines for depression and anxiety to help with those aspects. Apathy, loss of interest, is really common in PSP and other atypical disorders, and we don't have good treatment for that. Usually what we do for that is we say, well, sometimes when people are depressed, they lose interest in things, and that we do have medication for depression. So let's treat this in case it's depression, and hope that if we make depression better, the interest will get better. But if it really is pure apathy, unrelated to depression, we just don't have good medications for that right now. So moving to multiple system atrophy, again, that top part of the slide, the dopaminergic therapy, carbidopa, levodopa, is our mainstay uh, for this. But in this, we will sometimes try dopamine agonists, but having to be really careful about the blood pressure issues. Uh, we also sometimes try amantadine, not based on good research evidence, but what a few physicians have seen. That low blood pressure, the orthostatic hypotension, is another big issue in MSA. And for that, there are various approaches you can use, and some of them are drugs, and some of them aren't. So the non-drug approaches are drinking a lot of water, salt tablets. So you know, normally we tell you for your health, don't have too much salt, it's the opposite here. Salt helps you retain more water and that can help your blood pressure be higher. Uh, stockings or TED hose are often described. The caveat with that is often when you buy TED hose or these compression stockings, you buy the knee high. For this, they work best if they're thigh high, but you can imagine these are super tight socks. So getting them all the way up your thighs is really a challenge. So I would say the knee highs are used more often, but in reality, the thigh highs are probably more effective. And then uh, abdominal binders are sometimes used too. And the goal of these are either to help you have more fluid in your system and keep your blood pressure up that way, or compressing and so getting that fluid back up to your heart faster and better when you go to the standing position. There are a number of different drugs we try for low blood pressure. So fluticortisone, midadrine, and the newer droxydopa are probably the three most common. And then peridostigmine, or mestinon mentioned here is one of the other ones we sometimes use that's also used in other neurologic diseases. When we think about urinary dysfunction, uh, this is, can be an issue in all of them, but probably the biggest issue in MSA. And I'll say from my standpoint, the urologist, the urinary specialist, is probably the number one other physician that I use. So by the time you come see us, you probably have a ton of physicians and have seen a lot of people. And so I don't want to add to your appointment burden by making you go see someone else. But there are a lot of different medications for urinary problems now, and none of us are perfect. We can't remember everything. And I think a urologist can be very helpful, one, in making sure there's not something else going on, too. 
If you're a man, having one of these diseases doesn't mean you won't have a prostate problem. And the urologist can help tease out how much might be from this, how much might be from the prostate. Let's not say it's the MSA and miss another problem going on. And then they also can make recommendations about the best kind of drug approaches for the urinary symptoms. Sometimes in MSA, things are bad enough that people need a catheter. And for sleep disturbance, there's some debate about this, but this, this disordered breathing at night, uh, we, we do get sleep studies to look for that. Uh, and sometimes we use the CPAP to help people breathe effectively while they're sleeping. And then for the REM sleep behavior disorder, the acting out of dreams that we see in this and Parkinson's and dementia with Lewy bodies, the number one treatment I recommend is melatonin. Just that over-the-counter melatonin, we don't know exactly why, but it is very effective for these acting out of dreams. And there really aren't a lot of side effects. The other medication that we can use for this is called clonazepam, but that's in the benzodiazepine family. It can be a little bit habit forming, and there's some association that says that if you take it regularly, you increase your risk of memory problems. And so that's usually my step two. If it's really bad, I do use it, but I usually start with the melatonin because it works so well with less implications. When we think about dementia with Lewy bodies, again, under the Parkinsonism heading, we do prefer the carbidopa levodopa, and we avoid almost everything else, especially the dopamine agonist, because of that hallucination issue. This is the category for which we do have good medications for the memory and thinking changes. So the cholinesterase inhibitors I mentioned earlier, those are the drugs that were initially designed for Alzheimer's disease. They have been studied in people with both dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease dementia. And for some people with these diseases, they make a huge difference. In fact, these medications can be better in dementia with Lewy bodies than they are for Alzheimer's disease. And there is a, uh, something we see in some people with DLB who take these where the, they come back to clinic and they say, it's a miracle. You know, my loved one is like they were a year ago or two years ago. It's amazing. And so it doesn't stop the disease and it doesn't happen for everybody. But there aren't a lot of things we do where people come back to my clinic and say, it's a miracle. <laughs> and so if you have dementia with Lewy bodies, I always try these medications because while they're not stopping it, they can make a big difference in day-to-day -day life, at least in the short term. There is another kind of medication for Alzheimer's called memantine or Nemenda. It's also been looked at in Lewy body dementia, so that's DLB and Parkinson's disease dementia. And some of the studies show modest benefit. There's, there's some differences in how different physicians approach use of memantine. I think a lot of us are underwhelmed with what it does in dementia with Lewy bodies, but sometimes we'll try it. In DLB, we have the extra symptom of psychosis, hallucinations, delusions, and those actually can have a huge impact on quality of life if they are present. I don't treat hallucinations if they're not causing a problem. So if they're mild, they're not bothering anyone, the person with DLB sees a cat and it's no big deal, you know, I recommend against medication. There's no reason we need to take on the risk of medication side effects for something that's not a big issue. Let's not treat something that's not a problem. But if the hallucinations are a problem, that's different. And hallucinations can be a problem in multiple ways. So one problem would be if they're scary. So sometimes people see horrible, horrible images, someone getting murdered. You know, you don't want to see that. You don't want your loved one to see that. And so that would be a reason I would treat. Another reason I would treat hallucinations if there's a safety issue. So before I worked here, I was at the University of Maryland. It gets cold there. They just had that nor'easter. And sometimes 
The people in my clinic, they would see a kid outside the window at night and they would want to go to investigate. And you can imagine, you do not want someone going to investigate a hallucination, a child outside in the middle of the winter in the snow while their spouse is sleeping and may have not have woken up with it. That's a really big deal. Um, and so things like that where the hallucinations turn into safety issues, that would be another reason that I would want to treat hallucinations. Right now when we treat hallucinations, there's no FDA approved medication for that in dementia with Lewy bodies. So we rely on two to three. So quetiapine is a medication, a pill, that you can take for hallucinations. Um, it falls in this atypical uh, antipsychotic category. Everything else in that category, if you remember my first lecture, really increases the risk of worsened Parkinsonism and death. And so we want to avoid all of those if we can. Of those, the two that are safest are quetiapine, which is a pill, and clozapine, which is also a pill, but which requires weekly blood tests to make sure that you're not having a reaction where your white blood cells get less. So those, the clozapine we think works better, but weekly blood tests are really annoying. Um, and so it's kind of a matter of balancing what's practical and what works. There is a brand new medication called Pimavanserin or Nuplazid. It was FDA approved in 2016 for use in Parkinson's disease psychosis. This isn't technically Parkinson's disease psychosis, but it's in the same family, so some physicians are trying this new Pimavanserin as well. So this has kind of been a theme throughout this session is how do we balance health and side effects? So we might try some medications for Parkinson's symptoms, but we could be making some of those plus symptoms worse, the low blood pressure worse, the hallucinations worse, dopamine agonists can make you sleepy. Um, and so it is a matter of balancing the expected benefit and the risks. Now, I do want to spend a moment on exercise. So there is not a lot of information on the benefits of exercise in the atypical Parkinsonisms. But there is more and more and more evidence that people with Parkinson's who exercise do better. And we know that if something helps in Parkinson's disease, it may be worth trying in the atypical Parkinson'sisms as well. Different types of exercise can do different things. So Tai Chi and yoga are used for things like balance. There's some evidence that aerobic exercise is good for the motor function, the movement problems in people with Parkinson's disease. And then we know, so there was a study that was published just last month, in, I guess in January, for high intensity exercise in Parkinson's disease, suggesting that it might even slow the progression of Parkinson's. Now it was an early study, a phase two study, they need to do some more research, but a lot of physicians in the field are saying, hey, exercise helps Parkinson's, helps people stay more functional, helps them with balance, may slow the progression, we should be trying exercise in these atypical Parkinsonisms too. And certainly it helps with the, that idea of use it or lose it. When you exercise, we want you to exercise safely. If walking is a big problem, the treadmill might not be the best answer. So it is a matter of finding safe exercise, but we really do believe that exercise will be an important part of treatment for people with Parkinson's and the atypical Parkinsonisms. Uh, Lisa mentioned to you about falls, and I also mentioned it in my first talk, so we do want to do whatever we can to prevent falls. We know the two biggest problems are falling and swallowing the wrong way, and if you'll see in this graph from Dr. McFarland, falls start much earlier in these atypical Parkinsonisms than in regular PD. So in regular PD, you often have PD for years before you start falling, but it is much earlier in all of these atypical Parkinsonisms. 
And if you fall and you break something and you go to the hospital, you often take a big step down and never get back to the level where you were before. So we really wanna make sure that through therapy especially and through home modifications, we are doing everything we can to prevent falls. So we do talk a lot about interdisciplinary care at our center. So you've heard about that already today. PT, OT, speech and language pathology. Um, we involve nursing in different ways. So sometimes you need home care nursing coming out to your house. Uh, if you are uh, in a bed a lot of the time or in a wheelchair, you need to watch for wounds. And that might happen just from sitting or lying too long and nursing can help with that and then social services, such as through Francis. And I do want to spend a moment on palliative care, just so we're clear on our terminology. So palliative care is not just hospice, though in the US, we're not great at palliative care. So palliative care happens when we acknowledge that people have a disease that we cannot cure. And so instead of focusing on a cure, we focus on comfort, treating symptoms, and addressing quality of life. So the obvious comment there is, well, of course we're doing palliative care for atypical Parkinsonisms because right now we don't have a cure, we're targeting symptoms, and we're hoping to improve quality of life. So a lot of what we do falls under this palliative care umbrella. But palliative care does include that increased emphasis on let's make sure we're treating pain when it happens. Let's make sure that we're treating any suffering, which could be depression, but could also be other things. Let's treat emotional well-being. There's often a spiritual element to palliative care. Um, and then making sure that when we think about end of life, we're doing it on the terms that you and your loved one want. What do you want for advanced care planning? Some of this you do with your physician. Some of this you may do with the other staff we have at our clinic. So if you see Dr. McFarland or myself on Wednesdays, we have a volunteer from Haven Hospice who comes in on Wednesdays, goes in every room, make sure that you've thought about advanced care planning, make sure that if you have advanced directives, we have a copy for our record. So we do some of this. We don't currently have any kind of chaplain or spiritual advisor in our clinic. And so that's something that you, if you're interested, would do on your own. But palliative care is this broader approach to diseases that get worse that we can't stop. When we think about hospice, as Francis mentioned, that's usually thinking about the last six months. Now the last six months, and that's a Medicare rule, not our rule, can be a little tricky in these diseases. It's not always as clear as with cancer that has spread that we can't use chemo for anymore. It's a little trickier. We do have some clues. So clues that I use to say we're getting to that point where we need to start talking more about hospice, when people aren't eating as much, when they're choking more, losing weight. So we know that the choking and the decreased eating is having more problems when people aren't really able to get out of bed very well, so their activity is getting less and less, these are our kind of red flags that make me think that we're getting closer. But I totally agree with Francis that the more we discuss these things up front, the better it is, because we wanna make sure that we're doing what you want all along the way. We want you to have thought about it ahead, saying, when I get to that point, this is what I want, and we want to be talking about it at these visits because, as she mentioned, we only see you every six months. Well, maybe things change at month four and you think that we're getting to that point now. Well, I don't want you to wait two months till you come back and see me. I want to have had that conversation at our last visit or the visit before that. So you know to call me and say, Dr. Armstrong, you know, we've had these conversations at the last two visits and I think we might need to get someone in the home now. I think, you know, losing more weight, some of those red flags we talked about, and I can get those services going with Francis before you even get back to see me. So these are ongoing discussions, not things 
that should wait until the very end. And it's also important to note what Dr. McFarland put here. Hospice and palliative care is not giving up. It's not stopping to treat you, though there are some rules about what you can and cannot do on hospice. Many hospices won't let you keep doing therapy, uh, for example. Uh, it's not stopping all your medications. The medications that are working are there for your comfort. We would keep them going. And it's not losing your doctor. So I take care of lots of people on hospice. So we're going to conclude today with finding a cure. So this is the hope that we, we all look to. So when we think about research and about finding a cure, there are lots of different parts to it. So there is part, what do we know now? What do we understand about these diseases? How common are they? What's happening in the brain? Uh, we try to learn from our patients. So if you're seen at our center and you have consented, your information may go into our anonymous database so that we learn from the scales that we do when you come see us, the, the UPDRS with the Parkinson's findings, the MOCA with the memory testing. Uh, we do you know, imaging. We ask questions. We try to understand the mechanisms. We do clinical trials for drugs. Uh, and then we develop and test new therapies. So it's a big cycle with lots of different components. There are challenges to doing research in the atypical Parkinsonisms. So one of the big challenges is that they're uncommon. So we see a lot of them here at UF, but that's because if you have one of these rare diseases, you usually end up at a university. So some of you may be local from Gainesville, but we get a lot of people at UF from all over Florida and Georgia, because if you have something rare, you end up at a big medical center. But these are still uncommon diseases, and so getting enough people to test new therapies can be difficult. If you do have access to us, it can still be hard, because if you drive five hours to come see us at UF, it's going to be really hard to do a research study where you have to come back every two weeks. Driving five hours or staying overnight might work if you come see us every six months. But if you are in a drug trial and you need you know, checkups every two weeks, that is a lot more of a burden for someone who's living in Georgia. Uh, and that can make it harder for people to enroll in clinical trials. For some of these diseases, they're rare. And so that can be a challenge in general. But then what do you do if you have two or three drugs that want to be tested at the same time, then we're taking an already rare population and dividing it up. And then from the perspective of a clinical trial, these diseases progress slowly. So you may be saying, my disease is not slow. But when we think about clinical trials, a lot of clinical trials for other problems are done over eight weeks. Well, we often do not see a change in the atypical Parkinsonisms, at least not one that we can measure over eight weeks. So when we do trials for these diseases, we're talking about trials over six months or over 12 months, and that's a lot more of a challenge. And what we can use to measure the changes aren't perfect. So some of our tests probably aren't as good as we'd like them to be, and it can be hard to, to measure the change that matches what you're seeing in real life. We also know that drug development is hard, and this is not specific to the atypical Parkinsonisms. So this slide from Dr. McFarland just shows you here when we think about drug development in general, uh, in the drug discovery phase, pharmaceutical companies may test 5,000 to 10,000 compounds Maybe 250 of them get through to preclinical testing. That would be things like using animal models. Of those 250, maybe five get to phase one tests. So phase one is when we're really looking at safety, not even so much about whether things work, but is it safe enough to move on? And then from that five, we just keep getting fewer. So it's safe, so it goes on to phase two. You know, some are going to fall out at phase two. This really didn't make a difference. Phase three is, is it making a meaningful difference? And then we end up with one FDA-approved drug. 
Not only is that a lot of work to get one, but if you look at the bottom, you see the timeline. So that pre-discovery phase can take three to six years. That clinical trial phase with people is six to seven. FDA review, if you've got all your ducks in a row, is half a year to two years. And then here is where we follow up on a FDA approved drug and then see how it does once it's on the market. That's a lot of years. And so that's why some of these drugs, when they do come out, are expensive because, in honesty, the pharma companies have spent a lot of time and a lot of resources in development, but that is a lot of time and a lot of resources to get through to one that maybe works. So it's a difficult process. And there are some drug companies recently who have given up on the brain diseases and said, look, our Parkinson's and our Alzheimer's programs, just it's taking too long, we're not finding things, we're leaving that market. And those are for PD and AD, you can imagine it's a lot more challenging for the rare or atypicals. It also can be a challenge because the NIH doesn't fund the atypicals at the level it funds so many things. Now some of that is just the perspective of a lot of people have Alzheimer's disease. So the Alzheimer's disease funding is there in blue. When we think about uh, the millions of dollars going into funding, Alzheimer's is at the top. Parkinson's though is pretty common and that's in the orange, so still not a lot of funding for Parkinson's compared to the Alzheimer funding. And then the Alzheimer's disease related dementias, those are things like dementia with Lewy bodies, those are down here in gray, that's a mix. That would include DLB, but also other things. The atypicals, other than DLB in that other category, don't make it up here. There's just not a lot of funding. And so as researchers, we try to get our research funding in different ways. So we do apply to the NIH. Some comes from the NIH. Some comes from organizations like Cure PSP. Um, you know, they have some research funding. Uh, sometimes we study Parkinson's and hope that it'll help the atypicals too. Some of our funding comes from philanthropy. Some of our funding comes from university funding. So we try to get research funding every way we can so that we are propelling the atypical Parkinsonisms. So what are the new frontiers? Well, first I want to talk a little bit more about how we do research. And this has some of our pictures, but it's really just a smattering of some of the people that work on atypical Parkinsonisms here on campus. So when we think of the research being done for atypical Parkinsonisms, we start here at the basic science level. Oops. So these are our neuroscientists who are doing work in the lab. So basic science here would be like understanding, well, why does the alpha-synuclein clump? Why does the 4R tau clump? Is there a trigger? Is there some chemical reaction? Let's try to figure out what's happening at the molecular level so that then we can do something about it. <coughs> Dr. McFarland actually does some of that too. So he does both. He does work in a lab and work in the clinic. As we're learning some about What's, what's happening in the lab, these are the neuroscientists, then we have something called translational research. <clears throat> and translational research is when we take what we're learning in the lab and try to bring it forward to the patients. So an example of that would be the development of an alpha-synuclein vaccine. So someone here is working on an alpha-synuclein vaccine and that's an example of how we're taking about what we're learning about this protein and we're trying to find a way to combat that clumping. Still in the lab, but with direct patient applications. Then here in the middle, I put drug trials. So that would be things often we partner with drug companies to do drug trials, but sometimes we do them with organizations like the NIH. And then we also have research here on the clinical aspects of the disease. So what should we expect to happen in people with these diseases? What's that natural history? And what do we need to do for quality of life? Or what happens when someone with these diseases is hospitalized? What do we expect will happen? What will the outcomes be? And how can we make those outcomes better? 
And so that's actually the kind of work that I do. Dr. McFarland, he works in the lab and in the clinic. My research is really on this end of what do we expect with these diseases and how do we make care better? How do we make sure our clinical care aligns with the priorities of our patients and families and how do we improve outcomes? So here at UF, we have different people who really cover this whole spectrum of research. And we are not gonna cover that all in the next 10 minutes, but I wanted to give you a sense of all the different types of research that goes in to improving life with the atypical Parkinsonisms. Now we are gonna talk mostly in the next few slides about drug trials. You know, what, what are we looking for to stop these diseases? But I'm gonna highlight a couple of pieces of research that aren't drug trials. And I do wanna bring up this idea of biomarkers. So you may hear this word biomarkers. It's not just in the science, but it's also now in kind of lay or public media. And a biomarker is a measurable marker of some biological state or condition. And so biomarkers are used for a couple things. Biomarkers can help us with diagnosis, but ideally biomarkers would also let us know if someone is responding to treatment or how a disease is changing over time. Right now, the only way I know if you are changing over time is for me to examine you and talk to you and see how you're doing. That's how we track progression. There's no brain scan, there's no blood test, it's all about you and me in the clinic figuring out what's happening. Well, that can be really tricky because we all have good days and bad days. Uh, our scales aren't perfect. How amazing would it be if we had a brain scan or a blood test that could track how your disease is changing? Well, A, that could help us diagnose it you know, more effectively, and then B, could tell us how you're changing. That will also transform how we do research trials because then if we're studying a new drug, we could not only say, hey, is the drug making your life better? But on the MRI, instead of things getting worse, are we see them getting better? Or maybe they're not getting worse as fast as they were if you're not on this new drug. So finding biomarkers will help us with diagnosis. It will help us know what is changing in the brain over time, and it can also help us find new treatments. And Dr. Valancourt, whose picture is here, he's one of our PhDs on campus, and he is looking for biomarkers that could help us in Parkinson's disease and the atypical Parkinsonisms. This picture I have on the slide is actually from his research in Parkinson's disease. It was published in the last year or so in the journal Brain, which is one of the great neuroscience journals. And he's doing research very similar to this now in the atypical Parkinsonisms. So he's enrolling people with PSP or MSA, and it's a pretty easy study. So unlike the drug trials that we talked about, where you might have to come back every two weeks or every four weeks, this kind of research has two visits. Visit one, you have some testing, you get your scan, and then a year later, because remember the progression is slow, you have visit two where they do that same test and those same scans. And they can see, can this special MRI track how you're doing from point A to point B one year apart? There are some limitations, but if you're interested in this, a member of Dr. Valancourt's team is there at one of the tables in the back. And so if you want to learn more about this, she has a handout, you want to wave, you can find her. Um, so that is one of the active trials going on at UF looking at biomarkers. So we're going to start now by talking, we're going to end this talk by talking mostly about drug trials. So I'm going to mention one other non-drug uh, research that's going on in PSP. But for MSA and DLB, what I mentioned for all of these, what I mentioned earlier is really the case. We are looking for more treatments that help symptoms. We've talked today about how our treatments just aren't very good even for symptoms. So if we find more medicines that help symptoms, that would be great. But really what we want is a medicine targeting the proteins so that we can stop these diseases or slow them down. And so that's mostly what we're gonna talk about. So for dementia with Lewy bodies, there are a few different kinds of drugs being studied. 
So there are drugs that target the chemical serotonin in the brain. Um, and RVT 101, I put a little uh, X by it because uh, the Axivant, the company that makes it, announced last month that they are stopping development of this drug. They were studying it in dementia with Lewy bodies, but their interim analysis showed no benefit, and so it was stopped for futility. So this has been a trial over the last year or two, uh, but they're not going to pursue it. Nilotanserin, the second drug on this list, is a list very similar to the Pimavanserin I mentioned earlier. It's a drug that is hoped to reduce the acting out of dreams and reduce the hallucinations. And that interim analysis was promising, so they're going to keep going with it. And then SIN120 uh, is in trials for Parkinson's disease dementia, very closely related to DLB, and we're waiting for those results. There are, so one mechanism of drug development that's a little bit cheaper is saying, hey, I have a drug for something else, might it help this disease too? So we are trying to repurpose some drugs. So zonisamide is a seizure drug, and just last month there was a publication in the journal Neurology saying that maybe zonisamide might help some of the Parkinson's symptoms in DLB without worsening the cognition or hallucination, so that will be pursued. Safinified and resagiline are MAOB inhibitors. They're mild, but probably safe. And then this drug called adamoxetine is being looked at in Parkinson's mild cognitive impairment, so it might have implications for DLB as well. And then this third column here um, is a new drug that we will be getting, uh, we'll be doing the clinical trial at University of Florida as well. It's not enrolling quite yet. But this is a, a different kind of dopamine drug that's hoped to help memory and thinking. And so this trial just opened in the last couple months, and we're not live yet, but that'll be a study for memory and thinking happening here. But really, getting at that protein idea is this last column. Now these, the drugs mentioned here in this last column, none of them are being studied in DLB. So right now, these are being studied primarily in Parkinson's and also uh, in MSA, but these are the things that we're hoping holds promise. And essentially what these are is they're kind of like vaccines. So they're immune therapies that are trying to target the synuclein. And they are given by infusion. They are given about once a month, and two of them are currently in clinical trials, two from two different companies. And I think that's good news because it says, look, we're we think this will really work. We have a couple different drugs by the same mechanism. Let's come at it from a slightly different angles. So that's coming. Those two trials um, in Parkinson's are happening right now. So those both have passed the phase one. They were felt to be pretty safe. They had preliminary evidence that they were doing something. Um, and now they're in the phase two or phase two to three trials. So with MSA, there's not as much movement, um, but those same therapies, those vaccines that are targeting synuclein in PD should also work in MSA. Um, and uh, one of them is studied in MSA, and this is one of the things that Dr. McFarland reported back to me. Um, so, uh, it's being studied in Parkinson's now, but at the MSA meeting, um, they reported that the phase one trial showed that it was well tolerated and safe. And so it's being studied in Parkinson's and they're also looking to start a trial in MSA. For this second one here, this myeloperoxidase inhibitor that he mentioned there, he also got preliminary results from this at his meeting. And with this one, it was, the trial was discussed, but they felt that they, it didn't show a benefit, but they thought that they enrolled too few patients to know for sure. So the preliminary report uh, from that uh, meeting in New York was that it didn't help, but they think they had too few patients. And then there's a lot of interest in stem cells, and I'm not gonna go into this at length, but basically the stem cell work to date in Parkinsonism in general um, has not resulted in clear benefit, 
but there's a group in Korea and at Mayo looking at a specific kind of stem cell treatment for MSA, and they also reported the preliminary meetings at the meeting where Dr. McFarland was, and they found that the high dose of these stem cells uh, caused problems. It was felt to be toxic. And the low dose had some suggestion of benefit, and this is a very early trial, so they are looking at doing a follow-up trial to see if they can confirm benefit. So this isn't the kind of stem cell that you get at a clinic in Florida or Mexico or China. This is a very specific approach. So I think the report back from Dr. McFarland is uh, low dose, promising, worth further research, high dose, caused too much side effects. So then when we think about targeting tau, this is the one other study I wanted to mention that is not a clinical trial. So one of our big challenges with these diseases is that we know they're from a protein, but right now we don't have a way to see those protein clumps until you die and get an autopsy. Well, that's not a great way to diagnose a disease. It's too late at that point. So we would love to have scans not just that show us the dopamine loss or that show us the structural changes on MRI, but we'd really love to have scans that show the protein clumps. Now for synuclein, we are really not very close. They are working on synuclein scans, but uh, they just haven't worked out so far, so I don't think we're too close on synuclein scans, but we are close or close-ish on tau scans. So this is a picture of a tau scan. Tau scans are not FDA approved. They are not clinically available, but tau scans are now used regularly in research centers. Um, now, I will say the caveat here is that there are different forms of tau. So several times today you've heard me say 4R tau. Well, Alzheimer's is 3R tau, and these scans are really good for seeing the tau in Alzheimer's, and so far are only so-so at seeing the tau in PSP. But some of the research is suggesting that while it might not be as good for PSP as it is for Alzheimer's because the tau is different, it is giving us some information about tau, and that could really help us with diagnosis, saying, hey, look, this person really does have something in the tau family. So if this pans out for PSP and CBD, which is a little bit plus minus, it would definitely be a big tool in us taking care of people with these diseases. And we're looking for this in synuclein as well. So there's been a lot of interest in recent years in treating PSP. And this is an unfortunately a list of trials that didn't show a lot of benefit. So Riluzole, that's used in ALS, Divunatide, I don't even know how to pronounce that one. Um, high dose co coenzyme Q10, Valparate, Risagiline. Um, none of these showed clear benefit um, on the primary endpoints which looked at disease progression. Now there were different limitations to these studies. So for some of them, sample size was a problem. Uh, for some of them, we thought some of these were targeting tau, but right now we don't have a way to prove it. So we don't know if it, they were doing what we thought they were doing. So it may be that some of these will come back around, but right now we're not using any of them routinely to treat PSP. The one that probably has the most wiggle room is coenzyme Q10, um, uh, but no clear definite benefit. There are four uh, clinical trials for PSP currently enrolling, and we're doing two of these. Um, that all of these are targeting tau in some way. Um, so the first one, TPI-287, is targeting tau, trying to stabilize parts of it. It is only enrolling at two centers, UCSD and UAB. The next two are the two that we have here. So these are monoclonal antibodies, again, immune therapies for PSP. They work somewhat similarly, and both of them have had phase one studies that have shown that they seem safe and that they look like they're doing what we think they're doing with tau. And so both of these are in the phase two testing stage where we look to see if we can show more benefit and show safety in a larger group of people. These are infusions. I think they are also once a month 
um, and Dr. McFarland is running both of those trials at our center, looking to slow down PSP through similar mechanisms. And then the last one is uh, salicylate, uh, and that was enrolling just at UCSF. Um, oh, and it wasn't on his report from this MSA meeting, but Dr. McFarland said that per his information, uh, this has not shown efficacy, though that hasn't been formally reported yet. So a few things in the work for PSP. And then Dr. McFarland also mentioned these three other treatments that are being studied. Methylene blue, young plasma is being done at UCSF, and then this OGLI NAC. Um, so these are things that are either ongoing or pending, um, but there's a lot of movement in the PSP field now. And then just to circle back before we finish, back to what we talked about in that first presentation, most of these PSP studies are really enrolling people with that classic form of PSP, but the protein underneath is the same. So the hope is that by enrolling people with classic PSP, we'll have our best chance of seeing a meaningful difference. And if it works, we it would expect it to help other forms of PSP and then also help people with cortical basal degeneration, which has the same protein. So we're targeting one thing with the hope that it will help more in the same way that Parkinson's research target, targeting synuclein could also help DLB and MSA. Uh, so um, that is our group uh, at the Movement Disorder Center or a large part of our group outside our building. As you may know, we are in the process of designing and soon to be breaking ground on a new clinic that will be devoted just to people with neurological diseases. So stay tuned for that in the next year or two to come.